Let us begin. What is wrong with this picture? A young mother is at home alone. She's got preschool-aged children. Her husband's working long hours to make ends meet, and she's so tired of childish chatter and the boring television. She wonders what happened to all her dreams. She's tired. She's lonely. She's feeling kind of depressed these days, and she's begun to ask major questions about her life. Why am I here? Is this life all there is? What future will there be for me and my children? All of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. She peeks out. Oh, it's those Jehovah's Witnesses again. She almost doesn't answer the door, but she figures they saw her, so then she does. To her surprise, they ask all the questions she's been thinking about. And they say that, the Bible has the answers. Well, it's a cold, miserable day, and she notices a small, shivering child hanging on to her mother's coat out on the front doorstep. So before she realizes what she's doing, she's saying, well, come on in. It's cold. Don't leave the door open. Well, her own children come running, and they take this new child to play. And all of a sudden, there's a little bit of peace in her life. It's not so bad. She offers them a hot cup of coffee, and they sit down, and they start talking to her, and she says, Ah, oh, adult talk at last. You young mothers know what I'm talking about. She doesn't know it, but she's taken the first step in fracturing her family. By the time they leave, she has agreed they can come back again next week at the same time. She fingers her new Bible. It's written in modern English. They promise that she'll really understand it with their help. And she browses through the little book that they left her to read. And, you know, it's really so easy to understand. And, and you know, there's the little questions at the bottom of the page. And, gee, it's easy to find the answer. And she's all excited about this. So her husband drags home. And she eagerly shows her new acquisitions to her husband and she tells him, I'm going to start studying the Bible. These ladies are going to come once a week. And he says, yeah, sure, sure. That makes you happy. And he nods off to sleep in his chair. Well, he's sleeping when he should be wide awake to the dangers that are coming on his family. The weeks go by. The studies go on. The children are fast friends. The ladies are her friends. They talk on the phone. They help each other out by babysitting. A desire is forming in her heart to be just like them. One weekend, she takes her husband to a witness get-together. Everybody's super friendly to him. Makes him nervous. Also... His wife and the kids seem different to him somehow, but he can't quite put his finger on what it is, and he thinks, what's going on here? The presiding elder finally corners him for a chat. It's friendly enough to begin with, but the mood seems to change when he flat out refuses the offer of a weekly Bible study. He says, I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness. He says, and I want my one day a week that I'm off work, Sunday, to be spent in peace and quiet with my wife and my children. Thank you very much. The elder leaves them standing there. When they get home, the kids are in bed, he confronts his wife and he demands to know, what is going on with you anyway? He's amazed to find out that she has not only been studying but going out door to door and intends to be baptized at the next assembly. She is going to be a Jehovah's Witness with or without him. And the kids will be raised in her faith. He's never seen this side of her. He backs away and he goes to bed in kind of a daze. 
In the weeks and months to come, she makes good on her threats. She is baptized. She's dedicated. She goes to meetings no matter what. He tries different things. Gentle persuasion. Screaming! And everything in between. But nothing deters her. He now spends half of his day off alone in a quiet house, and the other half sulking about it. Even the kids are oddly silent in his presence. One day one in innocently inquires of, of her daddy why he wants to die at Armageddon and leave them. Why doesn't he love Jehovah like Mummy does? One day he looks up at his wife and he says, Who is this person? I want to leave this story briefly to state a few facts about living with a Jehovah's Witness relative or mate. You may no longer recognize the person you thought you knew. This person has been caught up in a cult group who does all of their thinking for them. They cannot react to normal reasoning processes. And no matter how hard you try to talk to them, they simply cannot be reasoned with because they're no longer open to logic. The cult group reasoning takes precedence in all matters in their life. You see, the member has been very successfully mind-controlled. They have given over control of every area of their lives to the elders of their group, believing that this is what God or Jehovah would have them do. If this has happened in a marriage situation, and the marriage has not broken down too far, now some of you are probably here because you've talked to me at the table, and you'd like to bring the marriage back to where it was before the spouse involvement with Jehovah's Witnesses, there are ways of reaching them in some cases, but not in all cases. You see, some have made up their minds that they want the marriage ended, and they're using this difference in religious religion as an excuse to get out. To try and save the marriage, you must be prepared to help them. Now, I'm not going to say this is the solution that works. It's easy. It's not easy. This takes commitment on your part, and patience is necessary. Remember this. First of all, when they were drawn into this group, they were very subtly told that there would be opposition to their involvement with the society from friends and family members. This is presented as being satanic opposition to serving Jehovah. Remember, your enemies will be members of your own household, subtly suggested to you in the early days of your studying with Jehovah's Witnesses, remember? Sure. So any negative reaction by you, the family, just proves the cult is right. Oh, I must be right. I'm being persecuted for righteousness' sake. <laughs> wowsy, wowsy. They now firmly believe that all opposition to them is from Satan and his evil world. This means you. Perhaps you haven't thought of yourself in this light. They're proud to be suffering for righteousness' sake. They feel justified in putting you out of their life if you oppose their truth or in any way interfere with their meeting attendance or their preaching work. They believe that the Watchtower Society is the only source of truth in the world today and any criticism of the society is criticism of God himself. Any printed materials exposing the organization are considered by them to be pornographic, from apostates and evil people controlled by Satan. Now, from our years of observation and also my own years inside the society, this is what you can expect. They have certain strategies within the organization for dealing with people who have mates that are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Their first strategy will be to try and win you over to become a Jehovah's Witness. 
This will be done by introduction to other witnesses in a friendly manner at your home or theirs. They'll encourage you to join in a Bible study and attend some of their meetings, maybe a special meeting at the Kingdom Hall. If done, if you respond and go, you can expect to be love-bombed by the other witnesses. Uh, They'll make you feel comfortable, and you'll feel like, well, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to be part of this group. This is, you know, nice people. That might not work, because you might not want to do that. Secondly, if they're unsuccessful in winning you over to become a Jehovah's Witness... Step two is try to get you to the point where you will tolerate your mate's JW involvement, including anything involving the children. And as long as you don't interfere in any way with your mate's and your children's Jehovah's Witness activities, your mate will remain with you, as long as you don't interfere. They always hope you can be brought around at a later date, And your non-interference is no problem to the society. However, point number three, if there's no cooperation in the above, that is, you won't tolerate your wife or your mate being a Jehovah's Witness and you won't let them take over your children's life, your home life may become so unpleasant that you will finally leave. And let's face it, some have even become involved with somebody else because they're treated so badly at home. This just delights the Jehovah's Witnesses because then they can misapply 1 Corinthians 7.15 and they self-righteously say to each other, but if the unbelieving one proceeds to depart, let him depart. Mm -hmm. And they feel, you know, real good about it. Very self-righteous. Mm-hmm. This would, of course, give them grounds for a divorce if you did go out and get involved with someone, and it would leave them free to remarry a Jehovah's Witness mate. So do not fall into this trap of leaving. I've talked to some here this weekend that said, I'm on the verge of leaving. I said, don't leave yet. Don't leave if you want to be part of your children's future. If you really cannot before God stand it, then, and must leave, then seek legal counsel regarding your children first before you leave the home. If you steadfastly refuse to move out or become involved with someone else, you said, I'm sticking at home, I've got kids here, uh, this is my responsibility, this is my marriage, I'm not going to have some religion break it out, break it up and you're insisting on staying home but at the same time you're interfering with your mates attending at the meetings well you may find yourself alone in any case the congregation will assist the persecuted Jehovah's Witness mate to leave you if children are involved the mate will feel that they must take the child or children out of the home if they don't They themselves personally, including their kids, will lose their lives and be destroyed when Armageddon comes. In their minds, unless they leave the home situation, they would have no hope for any future life. Because really, it's all based on works, isn't it? If you can't go to the kingdom hall to the meetings, if you can't go out in the service, and you haven't got any time when when, uh, Jehovah God reads your brownie points card, what's going to happen to you? Zot at Armageddon, right? Because you haven't got any works. So what's going to save you for crying out loud? So they feel that unless they leave the home situation, they'll have no hope for a future life. Jehovah God will destroy them all without a second thought. They're living under tremendous fear because they feel that Armageddon could come very soon. Uh, we've heard of numerous cases where the non-JW mate arrives home to find what? An empty house, mate, children, furniture, even pets missing. The bank account might be empty as well. And your children may be hidden with a Jehovah's Witness family in another location if they feel that they can come after you. I can remember being at assemblies and meeting up with people and they had a couple extra kids and I said, well, who are these? Well, they were kids from a custody case. And they had them in hiding. They, had, they said, better they be raised by Jehovah's Witness strangers. 
than that mate that won't become a Jehovah's Witness. They'll do it. Don't think for one minute they won't do it. They threatened me with that for my own children. They said, we're 50 miles from the U.S. border. And once we get across the border with those children, you'll never see them again. Don't think that it won't happen. It does. A fellow that we knew in our own hometown came off his shift at night at the mill. He opened the door to his house, and his house was absolutely empty. I mean, empty to the walls. He couldn't believe it. He went in. He looked everywhere. Nothing. Nothing. He said, they could have at least left me a pillow and a blanket to sleep with. He went out to the backyard, and in the doghouse, they'd left the dog's blanket. So he had to sleep wrapped up in the dog's blanket on the bare living room floor that night. It can happen. Well, you know, it can have another ending, too, besides the dog blanket and an empty house. Because we had one case that we got involved in. And I want to tell you the story of Carlos, and may it be an encouragement to all of you. Carlos was a kind of a excitable, hot-blooded Latin American type, and they had immigrated to Canada. He was busy at his job. He was a well-paid professional. And his wife got involved in just the way I described. He forbid her to do this and that, and everything and finally he came home from work one night and there was the house she left him a few dishes and some place to sleep and a few sticks of furniture but she was gone and the kids were gone Uh, much of his money was gone the accounts had been wiped out the children's passports were gone Uh, He contacted the kids' Catholic school where they went to school, and he was told that they had been removed, and the school had been advised that they wouldn't be back. He was alone. Strange country. No wife. No children. Somehow he heard about us, and he called us, and he was a very broken man. We went over to his uh, sparsely furnished house to offer some comfort to him. Despite his best efforts, he could not locate his family. He even spent his last few dollars searching for them. So we sat him down. And we said, Carlos, do you want your family back or not? He said, I want my family back more than anything else. We said, if you do, then here's what you do. We outlined this strategy. It it works, but it requires effort. We told him to go to the elders in all humility, admit that he was wrong in forbidding his wife to be a Jehovah's Witness, and say he would no longer interfere in any way with her going to meetings or out in the service, and tell him that he was ready to study the Bible himself. Well, you know, he was a superb actor. He put on the best display of humility I've seen in some time. He did a rehearsal for us. It was perfect. (laughs) The elders love this because they are on such a power trip. I have a little private theory that most elders are a zero in real life. This is their power trip to control the lives of people. If they're at work, they got some menial job where everybody tells them what to do. And they're encouraged to have low-paying jobs and poor education. So where do they get their kicks? Controlling lives in those committee meetings. You better know it. Uh, as I said, he you know, really did well. Now, we did not suggest this, but Carlos was so quick of mind that he went one step further. He drew up an agreement. It said... I will allow my wife to go to meetings and out in the service, etc. I agree to study the Bible one night a week. And he even sweet-talked them. He said, could my children just go back to their Catholic school while I'm finding out what the truth is? They can always be moved later, but it's in the middle of the term. And, well, he was so humble. I tell you, those kids are back in school like that. 
Yeah, and so he agreed to this Bible study. He was humble to a fault, I cannot tell you. He was a supposedly broken man. But he went one step farther. When he had the elders sign the agreement, and he signed the agreement as well, he took it to a notary public and had it notarized. <laughs> he had a legal contract. So the wife and kids were returned promptly, along with his furniture and his bank account. And he snuck in a phone call to us saying that he and his wife had a bottle of champagne and they were heading for bed. So <laughs> it didn't sound too bad. So, true to his word, when the elders showed up for the Bible study, they got out the books and handed them to Carlos, and they were ready to begin. He said, uh, 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 one moment, please. Here's this agreement here. It does not say book study. It says Bible study. You know, they're so conditioned to thinking Bible study means their books that it slipped right by them on the agreement. So he opened his Bible to John 1 1. He says, We'll begin by reading John chapter 1. <laughs> they didn't want to begin there, but he pointed out the agreement said, and he, you know. So anyway, what they didn't know was we were coaching him week by week in the background, feeding him information every time, and, and, uh, you know, we just had to laugh. He just tied them in knots. He gets them to agree to a point, and then he gives them some double whammy and prove that this wasn't exactly what it was and everything. And, and uh, his wife was supposed to um, not be there while the studies were on so he could catch up to where she was. So she was listening respectfully from the kitchen. And I tell you, she must have got an earful. By this time, uh, however... Uh, his wife was vacation pioneering. They were really pushing her. And about the same time she started vacation pioneering, Carlos lost his job in the recession. So there they were. Now we do have unemployment insurance and everything, but he didn't like his wife being involved with the witnesses. And uh, he asked us about it, and I said, well, you know, about the only way she could get out of it is, you know, she has a job. So he went down to the mall and put in applications all over for his wife. And he found her a job. <laughs> he went to the job interview. She got the job. So anyway, he informed her that in this family crisis where they were out of money and everything, his wife was to help out with this, this job. Well, the elders stepped in, and they absolutely refused. They said, no way. She is vacation pioneering. She is serving Jehovah. The time is short. Your wife will not go to work, and that's final. So, instead of arguing, he wrote to Watchtower Headquarters. Now, you should have seen this letter, too. You know, it was, it was a work of art. It said, uh, you know, dear brothers at headquarters, my wife is a Jehovah's Witness, to which I have no objection, you know. Uh, I am not a Jehovah's Witness, but I am studying every week with the elders. Uh, having a Bible study every week with the elders. And he, he said, you know, I have lost my job, and we are newly come to Canada, and we don't feel we should be taking this government money. Uh, I want to work for a living, and uh, my wife has this job, but the elders uh, feel that, you know, she... Um, you know, she should be uh, out in the service, and I would like her to work. And he said, brothers, tell me, am I not to be the head in my own household? <laughs> Back comes a letter, fast as you please, from headquarters saying, of course you're the head in your own household. And, you know, uh, anyway, uh, the vacation pioneering was cut out, and to work she went. So it was, it was a job in a shop, so she had to stand on her feet quite a bit. So when she came home from work on meeting nights, um, only on meeting nights, the other nights she could come home as tired as she wanted, she still had to cook dinner and do all the other stuff. But on meeting nights, he'd have a nice dinner ready for her with a bottle of wine. He'd tell her to just relax on the couch, and he'd rub her feet. <laughs> Many times she never made it to the kingdom home. <laughs> now, I almost hate to tell you this next part because 
it sort of reveals certain things about a woman's nature, but I, you know, I, I'll say it anyway. He opened his linen closet and he cleared off a shelf. And he cleared off a shelf for her. And he took her there and he said, now, this shelf is my private papers. I'm going to store stuff here. I don't want you looking at them. I don't want you touching them. This is my private stuff. A man is entitled to his privacy. And he says, this other shelf is for your watchtowers and everything. You know, equal space and everything like this. Well, <laughs> what can I say? Um, what was on his shelf, you may ask? Well, it was full of lists of false prophecies. <laughs> There were several things on how their Bible had been altered and who Jesus was and all kinds of stuff about the organization and everything. And uh, we couldn't swear to it, of course, and neither could he. But she just must have been snooping when he wasn't home because her enthusiasm for the society got less and less. And there was more to the story, but just let me say this. Eventually, he won her back. The frustrated elders couldn't stand this Bible study anymore. They told him he was, he was not submissive, and unless he read the books of the Watchtower, you know, he would never become a Jehovah's Witness. He said, oh, you mean we can never become Jehovah's Witnesses if we study the Bible alone? <laughs> oh, he was priceless. Anyway... <laughs> The elders canceled the Bible study, and of course that did away with them for one evening. That was wonderful, and he carried on with his subterfuge on nights that the meetings were on. And uh, he always had lots of fun things planned for uh, Sundays, you know. Uh, and finally he did get another job, and the family moved away together. And I say, Hallelujah. But there was never a frontal attack. You think we might be thinking of other tactics maybe here now? But what would have happened had he not outsmarted them and his wife and kids had stayed away? Maybe some are at this point in their own relationship. Your mate or your ex-mate, should you come to this standoff, will desperately try and get custody of the children. This is why we did the video battling over the children, because Dwayne works in child custody cases. I was a victim of the Watchtower Society myself, although the Lord miraculously stepped in in my case and intervened. But if you're at this stage, be prepared for the worst. Thank God you now have a video you can take and show to your lawyer so he'll know how to defend you properly. Many have faced false charges difficult to defend. You see, they want to prove you unfit as a parent. You will need strong character witnesses who have observed you with your own children. So if you're at that stage right now, you think about that. Who can you get who has seen you at different situations with your children and can go in a court and testify that you have been a good father or mother to those children? You're going to need strong character witnesses. The very least the Jehovah's Witnesses will do if they cannot take your children is to seek joint custody with the equal right to teach the children their beliefs. And remember, at their disposal will be their own legal experts, and your mate and children will be coached what to say in court. And lack of preparation on your part or your lawyer's part will lose you your children. You must learn their tactics. We're constantly dealing with people who say, my lawyer went to court, but he didn't know what to say. The witnesses got up and say, oh, no, they weren't against education, and, well, this was all right. And, this, and they said, we know that's not true, but what were we going to do? Frustrated, frustrated. Well, you need to get their preparing for child custody booklet. 
and you need to get the refutation booklet to go with it. So your lawyer has tools in his hands or her hands to fight back and turn their own tactics against them. It's the only way we're going to get justice in our courts. You see, they have no hesitation about lying, even under oath. They have a doctrine called justified lying. A Bible understanding tells you you only have to tell the truth to those who are entitled to know the truth. The courts, the legal system, family care workers, ex-mates, and all others because of their resistance to Jehovah's organization are not entitled to know the truth. This makes judges very angry. So tell them about it for sure. In Jehovah's Witness thinking, all these people that are dealing with the custody are of Satan. And it's okay to lie to him or his people just in order to pr- protect Jehovah and his organization on earth. So be prepared for this. It will happen. Your lawyer better know that they're prepared to stand up there, swear on the Bible, and lie through their teeth. They will do it and feel very self-righteous after they've done it. All sorts of things will be told to the children to scare them away from any involvement with the evil you. They will be coached on what to say about you in court. Even if the courts forbid religious things being taught to children during the visitation time, the children will still be instructed to hate you because you are opposing and not part of God's organization. And that ruling that neither parent is to influence the child religiously, that is a non-workable thing. Uh, Even though you get it, do you think for one minute Jehovah's Witnesses are going to obey that? Never. They're going to indoctrinate that child every moment they've got them. And if you're honoring the court order and not saying anything about your own faith, they simply are not going to obey that court order. And the judge and, and the court official should know that. Once in a while, an older child will become a Jehovah's Witness on his own. Might be your son or your daughter. You might really be surprised because you brought them up in church. But you see, at lunch hour, they've been going off in the corner with their little Jehovah's Witness friends. And they've maybe been having a Bible study for a year, two years sometimes. And that child, although very young usually early teens, says, well, the end is near and I'm going to be a Jehovah's Witness and that's it. And all of a sudden the child is going to be baptized and he informs you that he's made up his mind, he's going to be going door to door, he's been going to five meetings a week and what are you going to do? Well, I tell you what you don't do. You don't pound the table and say, no child of mine is going to blah, 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 blah. You know? There's the door, out the door. Don't do it if you care about your children. You take a deep breath, you pray, you ask for the Lord's help, and then do not criticize the organization in front of the children. Because this will encourage them to be stronger than ever. Because they're being persecuted for righteousness sake. And if you are making the home life difficult for your child... Those elders at the congregation will say to the child, well, you know, we can find a nice home you can live in. And don't think this doesn't happen. Many times very young children will run away from a home that's opposing the Jehovah's Witnesses, and it all ends up in foster care and the court system, and here's a loving family. And and in most court systems, when the child's 13 or so, they're allowed to say where they want to live. Uh, I mean, I've heard of cases here in the United States where the kid of that age goes and divorces his parents. It can happen under the legal system. At the very least, the child at 13, 14, 15 will move in with a strong Jehovah's Witness family, and they'll only live there until they're old enough to get a job so they can go out and be self-supporting, and they'll probably turn into pioneers because they're so dedicated and persecuted. So you're not going to win that way. Don't drive your child out of the home. Don't let them go out of your home into another one. Find other ways to deal with his Jehovah's Witness involvement. 
because once they are out of your home, they will be instructed to have no further contact with you, and they will have won, and you will have lost. It's as simple as that. Look at it this way. It's a dreadful situation. So your teenagers in this rigidly controlled group, rather than doing the usual rebellious stuff, like drugs, unprotected sex, joining gangs, etc. Sometimes it's just rebellion by the child, but in a different form. So what are you going to do with this headstrong, rebellious kid that's in your home and not drive him out? Well, you're going to have to give a little bit. You're going to have to do like Carlos did. Let him go to the meeting. Let him go out in the service. We all know going, out, going to meetings and going out in the service is not much fun when there's no opposition to it particularly to a kid. And then in the background, you plan lots of non-threatening family fun. And you do not open your mouth one word about the organization. You plan lots of non-threatening fun with your kid. Uh, Maybe you can all go out on a picnic or you can go to visit relatives in the country or you can do things that are not threatening to the child and give the child lots of physical love like hugs and kisses and we love you and we our teenagers sometimes say oh mom you know and they want to push you away hey but they like it they like to know that mom wants to hug them and kiss them even if they push you away and don't try and force forbidden things on that child if they tell you they don't want to have a birthday anymore honor that because if you force a birthday party or birthday gifts or something, then they got to make a choice between you and the organization. So just let it go. Maybe, you know, a while later or something, you can get them something that you know they like, but don't make a birthday thing out of it. Just love your child. Put up with them. Don't force them into Christmas birthdays and things. Always leave the door open that your child can come back to you or stay with you. Don't shut the door on that child. The next thing I want to talk about, and this is, uh, I really get my shirt and a knot about this one because it just, every time I get a letter about this, I just say, oh God, we've got to do something about this. And that is the elderly. Our parents. If parents or the elderly get caught up in Jehovah's Witnesses, Do some research and understand the problems before you jump in too quickly, yelling and screaming, waving your arms, demanding they go to a nursing home or come to your home or whatever else. Just back off a minute, take a deep breath. You see, aging parents living on their own are especially vulnerable to Jehovah's Witnesses. They are lonesome. The doorbell rings. Jehovah's Witnesses will sit by the hour and drink tea with them. Beats knocking on doors up and down the street. I did lots of tea drinking with older people myself. And you all did too, admit it. One lady used to serve a tin of cookies to me that was so stale it was the same cookies for three or four years, and I ate one every time. <laughs> Lonely elders usually welcome Jehovah's Witnesses. Friendships develop over the visits. Jehovah's Witnesses are also always looking for places for their full-time pioneers to live. Young people, often these Jehovah's Witnesses begin by doing odd jobs for the elderly. Cut their lawn, take them out for groceries, do something nice like that. Later they suggest that they move in and care for the elderly one in exchange for room and board. If the elderly parent does not have them move in, they'll still continue that influence. They'll still be there. They'll lavish lots of attention on the lonely elderly person, patiently studying with them, taking them out to meetings and to the service and to social gatherings. The idea is planted over time that they care more for the elderly than his or her own family does. And let's face it, folks, it's the case sometimes if the shoe fits, etc. Often the family is some distance away and has no idea of what is going on. And once the witnesses solidly convert the elderly one, the idea is subtly presented. Wouldn't it be nice to leave your state to God's work? After all, we're your family now. 
And why have your estate go to the worldly ones, your family? They'll just die at Armageddon anyway, and it'll be wasted. Wouldn't Jehovah be pleased if your estate furthered the preaching work? Uh, In our latest newsletter, I had an article in there about the society said how you can please Jehovah with your assets. And they had all kinds of suggestions, you know. I mean, you can just give them a power of attorney right now and, you know, uh, or let us take over all your savings accounts. If you ever need them back, we'll give them back to you. (laughs) I wonder who decides who's going to get it back or not, you know. Um, I mean, there's so many things. Name us in your will, you know. All kinds of suggestions. They are the most money-hungry group after mealy-mouthingly pretending they're not. Many elderly people have signed over their homes and other assets completely to the society. The society makes sure it's all done. They make sure that they close the one loophole, that your elderly one was not of a sound mind, by having someone there to sign an affidavit that the person was of sound mind, had been examined, and uh, paperwork is done. And it's almost impossible to have a court overturn these documents at a later time. These proceedings are sometimes done years before your elderly one passes on, and you know nothing about it. Often a power of attorney enables them to empty all the bank accounts and dispose of the assets well before the death of the elderly one. By the time the funeral comes, it's often a done deed. We heard from one family that learned that they had lost all the trust funds for the grandchildren's education. They had been told by their parents that that money was there when the children graduated high school. All their colleges were paid for. Imagine their surprise to find out there wasn't one cent for their children's education. Usually family members find out only after the funeral that all is gone from the estate. Even personal mementos, photographs, keepsakes of little value are withheld from the grieving families by the society. We talked to one family that uh, arrived home and they were going to stay in the family home when their mother had passed away. The door was locked. Their keys didn't work. The door was opened by a watchtower representative who notified them that they no longer owned the family home. And he suggested if they wished somewhere to stay overnight for the funeral, there was a hotel up the street. The family retreated to the hotel. They called in the highest priced lawyer they could get. And um, no way. Everything was done. The money had been taken years before. The trust funds had been cashed. Uh, The home papers had been signed over. And the watchtower had actually owned the home for a couple of years. They had a couple of pioneers in there looking after the mother. And here they thought, how nice that these clean-cut religious young people are taking such good care of mom. Uh Uh-huh. Hat in hand and in all humility, the family went back and knocked on the door and got the same guy at the door. They said, look, you've won. We've lost. Would you just give us our family photos? They can't mean anything to you, but they mean the world to us. No way. Go away wouldn't even let them have a family photo. And the neighbor later, later reported she saw them all being thrown out onto a uh, trailer and taken to the dump. If you have parents in a vulnerable position, be sure and check out the parents' wishes and wills while there's still time and they are of sound mind. Now, none of us like to go to our parents and do this, but really, you need to know about your parents' will. Where is it? Has there been any changes? Uh, What do they want you to do? If you find out that there has already been involvement with Jehovah's Witnesses, you may be able to make changes before it's too late. If you find out that they've been studying with the Witnesses or going to the meetings at the Kingdom Hall or having them regularly there, get professional legal advice immediately if possible. Have their assets safeguarded in some way. If your parents will agree, secure a power of attorney yourself and make sure that you notify your parents' bank manager and have, have their account flagged to notify you if there's anything suspicious going on. People trying to transfer large amounts of money out of term deposits and things like that. Um, 
And you will need not only physical strength and legal assistance to deal with Jehovah's Witnesses and their tactics, but you will need spiritual help to see you through. There is nothing more draining than getting into one of these situations. You'll need God's strength to get through all of this, and don't try to do it without the strength of God. And you and your legal counsel must understand always what you're dealing with, and that is a bunch of legal experts from head office. Instructions come from on high. It really is a theocracy in court cases, you know. comes from on high down. If Jehovah's Witnesses can do nothing else with you, they will try to break you financially by dragging out the court case with continuances and new dates and delays and one thing and another, And we know a wonderful couple that they have tried to fight back against the society and they have just lost everything. And the man just passed away a couple of years ago um, from stomach cancer, which they feel was in large part brought on by the stress. Because of these tragedies, because of the children, because of the elderly, because of the hurting families, This is why we've gone ahead and and put these tools in your hands that you can help people fight back. You do not fight spiritual battles with fleshly weapons. You fight spiritual battles with spiritual weapons. And that includes members of our families, immediate or larger families that are involved in these, this fracturing, this breaking up of the family, the breaking up of marriage, the children torn apart. And now I want to take the time to pray with people that are facing this terrible, traumatic time. And the God of all peace can reach out and just touch any situation. And I am standing here as living proof of that. He reached out in my own terrible hour of need where the witnesses had got in such a a case with me that there was a whole room full of them ready to testify against me that I was unfit. And I was so fit it was boring. (laughs) And the overseer had the nerve to say to me, I said, how could you put your hand on the Bible and lie? And he said to me, because it's justified. Because if we don't do it, your children will die at Armageddon. And and just at that time when I was going to lose my children, that was the time that this hard-headed, hard-hearted of stone, Jehovah's Witness, got on her knees and cried out and said, Jesus! Never spoken to him, only Jehovah. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're God or a God or the Archangel Michael, but Jesus, I want to know who you are. Come into my life and into my heart and show me who you are. And as I knelt there praying, I felt like a a cloak just fall over me, this wonderful peace. And I felt an actual physical warmth in my heart. I know it doesn't happen to everybody, but I guess I was such a tough case. God had to do something to prove he was in my heart. And in the midst of that terrible trauma, I got up and I was not the same person. When I read the Bible, it was like it was a brand new book. Hey, I had head knowledge of it. I could root to one end and the other and hops got scriptures faster than you could breathe practically. But it was like scales fell off my eyes and I began to see what the word of God really said. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the night before I was going to lose my children, I was on my knees again and I said, Jesus, I give them to you because I can't stand against all these witnesses. I didn't have anybody. I had my mother and Keith. They weren't much good. The others wouldn't. wouldn't testify (laughs) they were good for other things just not for character witnesses should clarify that 
So while I'm sitting there and just in agony because we're going into court, Keith is saying, oh, Jesus, we give you the praise and the glory and we worship you because we know these things. I said, oh, shut up. (laughs) Do you mind right here in court? Anyway, I gave my children to the Lord. I gave them all my problems. I gave them all my legal bills. I just gave everything to Jesus. I mean, when you're way down the bottom, you're pretty good at doing that. And when the time came and they called our name to go into court, and the Bible does say God will not put you beyond what you can bear. And my name was called to go into that court. And all those phony brothers that were supposed to be genuine friends of 15 years standing, all there salivating to testify against me. Their own lawyer walked up to the door of the court, turned around and said, I will not go into court against this woman. And he turned to the bunch of them sitting there and he said, and you, you're going to pay child support and she is going to have custody of her children. And the loving God that can do that for me, when I was a little ratched up ex-Jehovah's Witness of a few days standing, hey, he can do it for you too. So I want to have a special time of prayer after we close the session with any that are involved in their homes breaking up or child custody cases. We're going to get down here to the front and we're going to do some powerful praying. But as a general prayer for the rest of you, I want to see hands. Who has got family members snaggle pushed in Jehovah's Witnesses? Okay. I want all of you that do to stand up and we're going to have a prayer for you and your families. And let's mean business with God. When you mean business with God, he means business with you. You form a picture in your mind of of that specific loved one and you name their name as we pray before God's throne of grace. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you are the God of all peace. Thank you that you are the God of impossible situations, that you can turn things around, that, Lord, your power is better than anything that the enemy can offer. And Father, we are standing now in your presence and we are going to name the name of our loved ones before your throne of grace. And I just want to pause a minute. I want you all to say their names out loud. If there's a lot of them, just name them like Smith family. But let's just do it right now. I'm going to name mine. My cousin Donna and her family, Lord, and her children. I pray for my Aunt Mary, so influenced. My Uncle Jim, over 90 years old, oh God. And Lord, you have heard us name the names of our particular family members who are involved with Jehovah's Witnesses. And we name them before your throne and we claim them for the kingdom of God. And in the authority that you have given us as Christians to tread on scorpions and serpents and the evil thing, in that powerful name of Jesus, we bind that deceptive spirit of the Watchtower organization that it will no longer operate in their lives. Lord, we ask that you loose them to hear the gospel of Christ. Lord, however you do it, whoever you can bring into their lives, what piece of paper, whatever circumstances, we give you the permission to take them where they need to go so that they can only look up to you, Lord. And we pray for these family members. And we know that everyone here, Lord, has friends, acquaintances, persons involved in Jehovah's Witnesses. And you know them also, Lord. And we just ask that you would set them free in the name of Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit of conviction come upon them so powerfully 
Those of us that were led out of the organization not by a personal witness necessarily, but by the power of the Holy Spirit to convict us even when we sat in the middle of that deception. Oh God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. May he be ever so present in their lives and not leave them alone until they turn their eyes upon Jesus. Not Jesus the archangel, Michael, but Jesus, truly God, truly man. And Lord, as we now dismiss this meeting, we ask that you would go with us through the days to come when we leave this mountain. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness and ask that you bless our time of prayer together here at the front. In Jesus' name, amen.